This program is brought to you by Stanford University. So uh, I'm in uh, two departments, which you don't often see uh, described together or mentioned in the same breath. You can see it here, bioengineering and psychiatry. Uh, I see patients one day a week in the psychiatry clinic. The rest of the time, I'm working on bioengineering tools, developing new technologies to, to probe and understand the brain. What's going wrong in psychiatric diseases, it's very interesting. It's not the same thing as if you have a stroke. And so we need better tools to probe, to question, to finely tune. And this is an engineering challenge. The brain is wonderfully and unfortunately a very complicated place. One challenge that we're facing is the existing paradigm is maybe not exactly what we want. The chemical imbalance paradigm, the, the idea that, well, if you're, if you're depressed, maybe you don't have enough serotonin, you know, as if the brain were a, a soup of neurotransmitters. One approach that is starting to become used is going beyond chemicals. The brain is electrical. Can we speak the electrical language of the brain? And so these approaches are being called interventional psychiatry, and they have their problems, but they're also promising. Deep brain stimulation is one of them. You might have heard about this. This is where you can take a patient who has Parkinson's disease or also depression, major depression, and you can put an electrode in one brain region, and you can drive it, and you can get these amazing results. You can get sudden calmness or lightness, disappearance of the void, this classic depression symptom, heightened awareness, increased interest, connectedness. So this is really remarkable. This is this, this uh, provides hope that we can actually start to make a tangible impact on these psychiatric concepts, which not everybody even thinks are biological. There are problems with this, though. When you're just putting an electrode in the brain, this doesn't work for everybody, and often you have side effects, and I'll explain why that is the case. Another approach is called vagus nerve stimulation. There's a nerve that comes down the neck from the brain, and it helps helps control how fast the heart beats, how much digestion happens, things like that. But it's kind of a superhighway to the brain because there are also signals going back to the brain. And so you can put a little electrode around the nerve in the neck. And this is used for epilepsy, and we're starting to use it for depression as well. Well, this sounds good, right? It's not as invasive as deep brain stimulation, but it's got some major problems. And I've administered this to a few patients, and some of them have gotten better. But look at the, uh, the side effects people have. These numbers, you know, 68% of people have voice alteration. Their voice starts to sound a little strangulated. They cough. They can't breathe. They can't swallow that well. And this is because the electrode, it's the same problem you have with deep brain stimulation. The electrode doesn't know which cell type it should be controlling. It just controls everything that's within its reach. It's as if there were a conductor of a symphony just driving all the instruments at once without getting the drums and the piccolos and the bassoons separately. And so that's why you have side effects. You've got the nerves there that are controlling swallowing and breathing, and they're being affected by the electrode. So electrodes are fast but dumb. <laughs> and this is the core problem. And so the, the psychiatry is a hard problem because of the nature of the brain. This is an, another illustration of that. Deep within the brain, there's a structure called the hypothalamus, which is very small, it's very deep, but it's very complicated. It has neurons there, brain cells that do all kinds of different things. Look at all these different things hypothalamic neurons do. But they're all intermixed and intertwined, and what's shown here happens to be the red and green neurons. They happen to be ones that control thirst and social bonding, two very different, very different things, but they're all intermixed. So you can imagine if you put an electrode in there, be like being a teenager again, right? We... <laughs> so we don't want that. What we need is a way to go and just drive the cells we want and be the conductor and speak the language of the brain but also have specificity. And so this is what we'd like. We'd like to get the right cells. We'd like to be able to conduct. We'd like to turn on or turn off as needed. Sometimes in some diseases the cells are too active. Sometimes they're not active enough. We'd like to get deep in the brain, like to the hypothalamus. A lot of things that go wrong in psychiatric disease are deep. We want to have good measures of how we're doing, behavioral measures. We want to get readouts from the circuits. 
And we'd like all these to work in mammals like us. And this is a particular problem. The mammalian brain is the most complicated, but also the most powerful uh, co uh, computer that's, that's out there. And this is where we want it to work. So electrical stimulation, you put in an electrode, you'll get, let's say you want to get this top fiber coming from one cell, but you don't want to get this bottom one. The electrode can't discriminate it. The approach we've taken is to use light to bathe the whole area in light, but to make just the cell types we want sensitive to light. In an unlikely twist, the way we do this comes from micro microbial organisms that live in small niches, ponds, lakes, unusual places you wouldn't expect allies to come for psychiatry and neurology. One of them is a single-celled algae called Chlamydomonas from freshwater ponds. It's basically pond scum. This is a very ancient form of life. It's an archaeobacterium that lives in very harsh environments, very high salt Egyptian salt lakes that achieve extremely concentrated levels of sodium chloride. Very harsh environment, very hard to live there. But these both, both of these organisms have developed light-activated tools that we have then used. And I'll explain how those work. All brain cells are coated by a membrane that has proteins in them. And these proteins govern the flow of ions. So what's shown here in these blue uh, circles, this is the membrane. This is the surface of the cell. And we can put in light-sensitive proteins, like this one shown here on the left, that's sensitive to blue light. If you expose it to blue light, it's like a channel. It opens, and positive ions rush into the cell. Now, the, the pond scum uses this for its own purposes. It doesn't care about psychiatry. But this fortuitously happens to be neural code for on. When positive ions rush into a cell, that means on in the brain. This one on, on the right, this comes from the salt lake, from that ancient form of bacteria. And this happens to respond to yellow light, and it lets in negative ions. It lets in chloride ions. This happens to be the neural code for off. And because these are, gene, these are proteins that are encoded by genes, we can put the gene into the cell we want. And so that's illustrated here. This is what the chlamydomonas looks like. And so it normally uses this light sensor. When light's coming from the side, it's got a little eye spot that it uses to detect the oscillating light signal. And it turns toward the light so it can photosynthesize. It's basically a plant. But we took this gene and we put it into neurons in the lab. And here you can see they're glowing yellow because we put in this gene coupled to a yellow fluorescent protein. And what are these funny saw-tooth-shaped things here? This is the language of the brain. This is the currency of information flow. Each one of these saw-tooth deflections is called an action potential, sometimes called a spike. And you can see we're driving them with blue light pulses, as shown by those little blue dashes. So just using blue light, we're speaking the language of the brain. Now, the yellow light inhibition works in a similar way. The archaeobacterium uses this to pump salt. It's in a high salt environment. It wants to pump chloride ions to stay alive. We can put this in to brain cells. We can even put it in into cells that have both the stimulator, called CHR2, and the inhibitor, called NPHR. We can put them in the same cell, and then we can drive those spikes, that language of the brain with blue light pulses, and then we can shut them off with yellow light. So even the same cell, we can turn on and off with different colors of light. OK, so this is nice, but what about, what about moving, behaving mammals like us? So one challenge is how do you get light in? And this is something we can do using fiber optics. This shows an animal. This happens to be a rat that has a very, very thin fiber optic. This is much thinner than the, fiber, than the electrodes we use for deep brain stimulation in people. This is 50 micrometers in diameter. And you can depth target it to a structure you want. This could all be internalized. It could be inside the animal. But it's shown here so you can see the glowing fiber. And we can use this to go in and target deep brain structures. And an illustration of this, I want to show you a mouse. You might know that the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body and controls movement toward and attention toward the left side of the world. So we put in this optical fiber, and we drove right motor cortex, right part of the brain that controls complex movements, thinking maybe we could get an animal to want to turn to the left. 
And this movie is shown here. You can't even see the fiber optic, but when the light stimulation goes on, you'll see a little blue light reflectance from the, from the head of the animal, so you'll know when the light goes on. Turn it off down at the bottom. It stops. So this is a little scary, right? <laughs> I don't want to sweep that aspect under the rug either. In fact, I'm going to come back and talk about it at the end. From the clinical standpoint, this is wonderful because this shows we can use light to help modulate behaviors. We're starting to apply this to interesting neuropsychiatric disease questions. A disease you might have heard about is narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a very serious illness. It's caused by deficiency in a kind of neuron called a hypocretin neuron. And these neurons lie deep in the brain, but they send projections very broadly shown by these red lines that go all over the brain. And these have been implicated in arousal, awakening, staying awake, also attention, also feelings of reward or pleasure. And this happens in dogs as well as people. This is illustrative. We can see when these animals get excited, when they get a positive social stimulus or a nice looking meal, they have these drop attacks of sleep and they'll drop in and out of sleep. And here's this little fella. <laughs> and he'll, he'll, he'll keep, he keeps getting excited, keeps falling asleep. The dogs on the left are getting excited by a social stimulus and they end up falling asleep too. This shows you how, what a striking uh, effect a small population of cells deep in the brain can have. But I can say it also, it also does have big clinical implications. Now, there are medications that treat narcolepsy, and provigil or modafinil you might have heard about. This helps a little bit with narcolepsy. But what's interesting is the commonalities you see ac across uh, species. And so human beings, they can have a deficiency in the hypocretin system as well. This is a well-controlled clinical setting. I want to show you a movie of this a girl with narcolepsy. She's, she'll, she'll be okay, she's with her mother, but you'll see when she gets excited, that's when she also has a, a, a cataplexy. She has a drop attack of sleep, and she'll wake up again in a few seconds, too. The point is to, is to show you that this is, these are neurons, the hypocrete neurons are deep in the hypothalamus. This is the same structure I showed you with all these intermingled neurons. So if you think about trying to help her, Yeah, so you can imagine if you had a, a child like that, but she'll, she'll be okay, she'll wake up in a few seconds, but we can't, right now we don't have the tools to selectively, uh, to help her, to control the neurons that need to be controlled to wake her up. Okay, she'll wake up by herself, but the interesting commonalities of being triggered by excitement or, or pleasure are quite interesting. So can we go in and, and target the hypothalamus? Well, we can go in there, we can put a fiber optic down exactly where we want it to go, deep into the hypothalamus, very thin fiber. We can control an area of the brain. And we can actually, this is sort of an EEG, if you focus here, you'll see us, we're stimulating here with blue light. And here's an EEG, and you can see it start to change right about here. It gets a little lower in amplitude. This is a muscle graph showing the animal starting to move. So this is a wake event where the EEG changes, the animal starts to move, and we were able to trigger that with a blue light pulse. So this actually now is a handle on a specific population of cells in the brain that we can control and we can modulate a complex behavioral state transition like awakening. We're starting to apply this question, these, these tools to other questions like depression. This is the Okavango Delta in, in Africa. This is a river that just flows out into a plain. It doesn't flow into a lake or into the ocean. It just flows out until it dries up, percolates for a certain distance through the plain, and then it dries up. Now, we have used this concept to try to understand depression. We think that due to some cells not working right, activity doesn't flow far enough through the brain. It actually dies out like a river running into the desert and, and, and drying up too soon. And we think there are particular cells that help mediate that percolation, that mediate the flow of activity, of electrical activity through the brain. And we think some of these very special neurons have very special long-range connections that make the brain a small world network and that govern the flow of information, the percolation of information through the network. 
And so we're able to apply those tools to try to understand depression. So an example movie of this kind of thing is shown here on the left. You can see the C-shaped structure. You can see activity flowing into the C-shaped structure. This is a movie of activity flowing through the brain. It flows for a certain distance, just like the Okavango flowing into the, the desert. But then it stops after a while and, and dies out. And this, we have found, is different in depression. We have animal models of depression, if you can believe that. And we can see that the activity dies out before going far enough in the, in the depressed case. And if you give them antidepressants, it percolates farther. And we're combining these concepts with the optical control concepts I told you about, where we can drive neuronal activity with blue light pulses, shut it off with yellow light pulses. These are all optical technologies for imaging, for seeing what's going on, and for controlling what's going on, all on the millisecond scale, which is the language of the brain that we're trying to speak. So I just want to close uh, with a, a pointer to two concepts that I think underlie the, the reasons we've been able to make the progress we've been making. One is I want to stress the importance of basic science. And I think there's no better illustration of it than these microorganisms. These were studied for decades by people who just thought they were cool. They didn't have a thought for psychiatry or neurology, much less neuroscience. They were just interested in these fascinating organisms, studied them, studied their properties. Without that, we would not have been able to do what we did and are doing to try to help uh, patients with serious diseases. So if you ever need a case study for basic science, if you're talking to a friend, talking to a, a politician, this is something that I think people need to know. Also, of course, ecological protection is very important. Some of these come from niches that are, are fragile or rare, particularly these unusual salt lakes in Egypt where the archaeobacterium comes from, this points to the need to preserve ecological diversity as well. So this is our, this is our mission, to try to bring bioengineering, bioengineering tools to psychiatry. But as I mentioned, there are important implications to this, and we have to step carefully. We have to step judiciously. What will we be able to control? We could make a mouse really want to turn left. That's not so harmful in itself. There are, you know, the hypothalamus controls all our drives. It, it controls all our, our needs, okay? And so this becomes a very complicated thing once you have the power to control that. And so with each step in new technology comes new responsibility. We're doing it to try to treat patients. We also have to keep a handle on things and make sure that the scientific issues are, are dealt with, but also the ethical issues. Even the philosophical issues, you know, these now start to strike to questions of what does it mean to, to want to do something? What is the neural code for wanting something? And this is uh, something which, you know, I, I don't have training in philosophy, but I want to make sure that the people who, who use these tools and, and who start to apply them are, are thinking about them, because this is, this is very important as technology uh, progresses. Thank you.